have with us here today Matt Winkler, who changed the landscape of business journalism through his Bloomberg way by co-founding Bloomberg News and also writing the Bible of business journalism, the Bloomberg way. And he also served as an editor-in-chief for more than two decades. Um, so thank you for being with us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. So uh, Matt, you uh, had a fascination with news since the Please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome our dean. <laughs> so, <laughs> you had a fascination with news since an early age. You worked as a newspaper boy, correct? Uh, what made you want to get into news? Okay, so it goes all the way back, really, to my first job, which was delivering newspapers as a newsboy uh, at the age of 11 for three years. and. Uh, you know, the first thing I had to do was unpack them and then wrap them and do all that stuff and deliver them. In the course of doing all of those things, I got to read on occasion. And uh, it started there, really. Um, then, you know, you could say uh, when I was where some of you are right now, I was uh, lucky enough to be a reporter while I was still in college. And I couldn't get over the fact that um, I could ask all the questions I wanted and somebody would cut me a check at the end of the week. And I thought that's a pretty good way to go through life. So there it is. Perfect. Um, before the work Bloomberg News, you worked at the Wall Street Journal for 10 years. But even before that, you actually received a rejection letter from Wall Street Journal before you got hired there full time. Could you share the story once again and maybe give some word of advice for young aspiring journalists? Sure. So, um, uh, let's see. By the by, 1978, uh, I had long made up my mind that I wanted to work at the Wall Street Journal, which, by the way, in those days really didn't run any photographs. You know, they, they said, you know, a thousand words is worth a photograph, so forget about the photograph. You know, it's just like, you know, they, <laughs> words mattered. And it was actually, I thought at the time, the best written and edited newspaper, um, certainly in the United States. Uh, you could never find, at least in the three-star edition, you could never find a copy mistake. It was flawless. And the writing was spectacular, and it was everything that I aspired to. Uh, there was a, a little bit of a, a drawback in that um, I didn't have a lot of business and economic reporting experience, so I decided to get some. And I was working at the time for a small newspaper, almost as old, actually older than the Wall Street Journal, called The Daily Bond Buyer, and I was covering the bond market. And I decided that I had enough experience in 1978, so I, in my lunch hour, I went to, uh, walked, uh, whatever it is, 10, 15 blocks to the Wall Street Journal office and went into the, uh, uh, the, really, it was sort of the gateway for, for anybody. It was the uh, HR, what we would call HR department now. Um, and there was a woman at the time named Pat Malloy, who was as intimidating as anybody could be. And I handed her uh, my newspaper clips and a uh, resume, and I said, would you please give this to uh, Mr. O'Donnell. Lawrence G. O'Donnell was then the managing editor of the Wall Street Journal. And she looked at me like I was kind of crazy because nobody walks in off the street and hands clips and whatever. And I had filled out the application while I was there. So uh, a week later, I got a very nice envelope, about a small one, so big, and uh, addressed to me. And I saw in the left, flush left corner of the envelope, Lawrence G. O'Donnell typed. And I opened the, the envelope, letter, and said, Dear Mr. Winkler, we have no openings for you now or in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Sincerely, Lawrence G. O'Donnell. <laughs> so I said, oh, what the hell? So I put the envelope back in my my coat pocket, and I figured I'll call him in six months. Uh, about two weeks later, I got a call from the New York bureau chief of the Wall Street Journal, uh, Stuart Pinkerton, and uh, he said, you may have received a letter from the managing editor. And I said, yes. And he said, disregard it. <laughs> 
um, do you think you can come in for an interview? So I said, okay. So I went in the interview. We, we met. It was very nice. Looked at my clips, uh, my work, and he said, okay, um, I think I'm going to have something open for you in six months. Can you wait that long? Of course I can, you know, sure. And um, sure enough, six months later, uh, I was called again, called back, and uh, uh, two weeks, three weeks after that, I was working for the Wall Street Journal. And I, many on many occasions, rode up and down the elevator with Lawrence G. O'Donnell, but we never met. Hmm. So uh, there it is. Now, advice, I would just say, as Winston Churchill famously said, never surrender. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, what I say to my children, too, is pursue your passion. And so that was my passion. Don't harm anybody, but pursue your passion. Would you say it's easier uh, to be persistent when you're in pursuit of your passions versus something else? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, you know, you should always do what you believe in most. Uh, provided you don't harm harm anybody, I mean that's it. That's the other side of it. But absolutely. Okay. Um, so um, I'm really big on mentorship, and uh, I, I feel that a lot of us um, we get to wherever we are because we have people who help us along the way. And uh, I just want to know if you had any mentors along your way, and what was some uh, pieces of advice or the best piece of advice that you heard from one of your mentors. So I've had many people who uh, I consider, you would consider, I think, mentors who are inspirational to me. Um, and I'm very lucky. And I have to say that um, I wouldn't be here sitting talking to you if I didn't have so many people who uh, were inspirational to me. And it starts really early on uh, in my life. Many of them are teachers, of course. Uh, uh, they're really unsung heroes, I think, teachers. Um, they're so important. Um, and I had wonderful teachers uh, all through my education um, and who encouraged reading um, and thinking and debating, things like that, in high school. Uh, in college, it was obviously more advanced, but it was the same thing. Um, my passion really was simultaneously history, and I had wonderful professors in history. Um, and then in my first newspaper job, uh, in some ways the person who was most inspirational to me was uh, Barbara Buckham, who everybody called Mother Buckham, and she walked around the newsroom with a red pencil that, you know, self-sharpening red pen. They don't, they probably don't make these anymore, but you know. Um, and she used that to mark up everybody's copy. And by the time she got done, it was bloody. I mean, it was, it was very red. And um, she was ruthless uh, and rigorous at the same time. And um, that was a great place for me to start because as you well know, um, if it isn't true, it isn't news and accuracy above all else. And there was Mother Buckham at the very beginning of my career uh, making it so. So, yeah, uh, I'm eternally grateful for all these people. Um, so Bloomberg News, it started with the very famous phone call of Mike Bloomberg to you when he asked you for advice. And together, you took uh, Bloomberg Terminal and married it with news. Could you have imagined in those early days that it would turn into this media empire that it is right now? And could you describe a moment when you realized that Bloomberg News were really disrupting the industry? So uh, I, I wouldn't have dared to imagine and I didn't dare, we didn't dare to imagine that uh, we would be as successful as we became. Um, we were too busy actually thinking about literally what was in front of us um, every day and getting, getting it done. And then the next day, um, 
we didn't really do you know long range planning. Uh, we did have a vision of what we wanted to accomplish, and, and that's the better part of your question, I think, is you know what was the vision that inspired us to do this? And for me as a journalist, it was recognizing then as a reporter for the Wall Street Journal that Bloomberg, uh, in its infancy, before there was news, and there was eight years of Bloomberg, a uh, small company, um, that we can say now, I can say now, that totally anticipated what y you would all consider the internet and online. And Bloomberg was that before anybody realized it. So that was a, it was a big thing. It was a 24-7 computer that sat on a desk, and anybody who managed money invested money, traded money in any form, could see instantly on the Bloomberg what the relative value was of that money. It was very uh, powerful, by the way, because at that time, there was nothing in the media landscape. None of the news giants that we're all familiar with had the thought, even, to take all the data that they had, put it on a computer so that they could access the data for example, the Wall Street Journal, say, going back to 1898, when it started publishing. Um, it never occurred to the Wall Street Journal to take all of the, the price information, the yield information, you know, the, the real estate, put it on a computer so they could access it, and so it could know what today's real estate is to yesterday's or 10 decades ago, or the same thing with treasury bonds. The only company in the world that did that in 1982 was a company called Bloomberg in its infancy. Now, I was lucky enough as a reporter uh, at a time when the Wall Street Journal was so dominant uh, in the story of money to recognize that Bloomberg was doing with, with data what we're supposed to do as journalists. You know, we're supposed to tell people every day, inform people what the relative value is of anything. You know, why do I care? Why do I care now? You know, everybody has to write a nut graph. Uh, relative value is essential to writing your nut graph. And here was Bloomberg doing with data something that none of the media companies were doing. And so I became interested as a result of that, partly in some ways out of fear, because I was, you know, sitting in my perch at the Wall Street Journal uh, and realizing that Bloomberg was maybe three weeks, four weeks ahead of anything I could possibly write. Mm -hmm. So I got more interested in it, and then I wound up with a colleague who was an expert in technology. My my specialty knowledge was uh, credit and bonds and so forth. So it was a uh, symbiotic partnership. And we wrote this story about Bloomberg. And it turned out to be very revealing in the sense that it, it said, you know, why haven't the media giants done what, what Bloomberg has already done? And Bloomberg potentially, at least, is a threat to them, including my own employer, which did not make me very popular, by the way, when that story appeared on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Your uh, question about disruptive, when did we know that we were um, disruptive? So by the time Mike and I had agreed that I was going to leave the journal and we tried to make it as, uh, as comforting as possible in the sense of least disruptive as possible, it took me, I don't know, two and a half months to leave the Wall Street Journal to come to Bloomberg after I decided to do it. And that was because I had all these commitments, I had stories I had to write and everything else. So it was all very amicable. And by the way, most of the people at the Wall Street Journal thought I was nuts because actually people, nobody had heard of Bloomberg. And so we, it was an insignificant company. Couldn't understand why I was possibly doing this, throwing away a great career at the Wall Street Journal. So I get to Bloomberg and uh, we had, we did have a an agenda of what we were going to do, um, and we were going to try every single day to show all of the people who use the Bloomberg that if they use the Bloomberg, and if Dow Jones News Service left the Bloomberg and it was on 
the Bloomberg, we, we had to pay for it, but Dow Jones News was on the Bloomberg, AP News was on the Bloomberg. If those news services left, that our customers wouldn't miss anything. So it was kind of daunting. Uh, but we, we had an agenda how we were going to do this. And uh, we realized we were uh, significant when August 14th, which was two months after we published Bloomberg. the first story of Bloomberg publicly, uh, the Wall Street Journal, uh, no, first it was the Dow Jones ticker, which was the real-time service of the Wall Street Journal, ran an item that said it will no longer do business with Bloomberg because it doesn't believe in doing business with a competitor. And at that time, Dow Jones not only had its news on the Bloomberg, cost a lot of money that Bloomberg had to pay for, uh, but also Dow Jones technicians installed Bloomberg terminals on desks. So those were two very important pieces of, if you will, the Bloomberg economy. Um, the technicians from Dow Jones went away immediately because they could, and they were replaced by General Electric technicians. The news service had to stay a year because it was under contract, so it was kind of peculiar why you would announce something like this and give us at least a grace period of uh, more than nine months to maybe figure it out, even if it was an execution. I, at the time, thought this was the greatest moment in the early life of Bloomberg News because if they had sent me a bill for advertising, I would have paid it on the spot. I mean, whatever it was, whatever the amount was, because they ran the same notice in the Wall Street Journal in a box the next day, so their million plus readers could see this, and if they didn't know what Bloomberg was, <laughs> now they knew. We had nine months to kind of figure out, okay, what are we going to do? And we knew that... Um, we had gotten somewhere when H. Ross Perot and Company, based in Texas, sent a letter to a salesman, a Dow Jones salesman in Chicago, uh, Keith Baggy, and said, Dear Mr. Baggy, um, we are terminating our subscription to Dow Jones News on the Bloomberg because we find we get everything we need at no extra charge from Bloomberg News. And, uh, you know, that was like March of 1991, so we were not even a year into publishing. And it was a reality check for all of us that maybe we could do this, maybe this was going to work. Uh, not that we had our doubts about why it should work, uh, because what we were doing was taking this data, which nobody had thought to do, and marrying it with narrative journalism. And it wasn't just narrative journalism, this just in, like show up and throw up headlines and things like that. It was we were writing uh, as much as we could, um, you know, 800 word plus pieces about everything it fused with data that you and we could say, look, don't take our word for it. Here's the data you can. And so the stories had a credibility that really no news service had at the time, certainly covering business and finance and everything else. I mean, our main competitors who were real time were literally doing staccato headlines and, you know, what they would call fills for the staccato headlines, whereas we were doing as much as we could uh, tomorrow's news today. Mm -hmm. And that was what was driving us. And so really after the first year, we knew we were onto something. And, and, and that was the takeoff or the launch pad, if you will. So what was the hardest part about that first year? Um, well, uh, we had zero. I mean, it's, uh, people knew who I was uh, as a journalist. But I got to tell you, you know, the, the first five, six journalists at Bloomberg News in New York are real heroes. And some of them, by the way, are still working at Bloomberg 28 years later. So feel good about that. But uh, so they would make these calls and to um, bankers and brokers and economists and all kinds of people in the Wall Street community. And repeatedly, they would be uh, dismissed. Some people would hang up the phone on them and say, we don't need any more stationery. Stop calling us. And because there was a, a um, stationery store 
literally on Wall Street, called Blumberg, and uh, with a with a U, <laughs> and uh, that gives you some idea. Yeah. Nobody knew who we were, um, and uh, you know, so that was that was tough getting over that, uh, and that takes time, and that takes you know breaking stories and getting noticed and everything else. Uh, so that was that was a big hurdle. The second big hurdle, which um, is is in the book Bloomberg by Bloomberg, was I didn't realize how difficult would it be early on to uh, literally get access to economic data that is essential to writing every story. And when I approached, um, it was in Washington D.C. initially, but it wasn't just Washington; it was all over the world. We had to do this. Uh, to get the credentials to cover gross domestic product, this just in, inflation, this just in, you know, and so on. Uh, we needed to be approved as journalists. And I didn't think that was going to be a problem because everybody knew who I was, whatever. But there was this matter of our owner, Michael Bloomberg, who journalists at the time, who decided whether you were credentialed, the... the uh, if you will, the committee that does this in Washington, D.C. was a group of journalists because the government didn't want to be in the business of deciding who's fit and proper to leave it to the journalists. And I uh, went to the head of the committee who happened to be a colleague of my former colleague of mine at The Wall Street Journal. And I said, you know, uh, how do I get these, uh, you know, dog tags so we can go cover this stuff? And, and he said, well, what are you? And I said, we're an electronic newspaper, which sounded really magnificent back then, by the way. It was four years before Netscape, you know. Um, and he said, uh, what do you mean? And I said, oh, well, we have these terminals all over the world. Our stories are on 24 hours every day, 365 days a year. Um, anybody can access them who has a Bloomberg. And he said, well, where are you published? I said, right on the terminal. And he said, what newspapers? And I said, um, well, you know what? At some point, a newspaper could buy the Bloomberg service and could publish it. Well, where are you published right now in a newspaper? And I said, nowhere. Well, we don't have a criteria for you. I said, what do you mean? He said, we don't have a criteria for you. I said, what does that mean? You mean we can't cover this stuff because we're not published in a newspaper? Even though where nobody used the word online back then, except we did. We, we used that word. Um, and, uh, you know, and then there was, uh, oh, and who is this guy Bloomberg anyway? Some financial guy. He can't possibly be uh, legit, right? Mm -hmm. You know, because he comes from Wall Street. I mean, that, so there was that bias. And then there was, well, uh, every problem is an opportunity. And so... You asked, you know, it was a hurdle. I was in despair, practically in despair. I said, this isn't going to work unless we're able to cover the economy every day, and not just in Washington, but everywhere in the world. And if this sets a precedent, we're not going to get out of the starting gate. And, uh, you know, as it turned out, uh, I had been besieged by my friends who were at the New York Times who wanted a Bloomberg because they realized it was helpful. But they kept saying, we don't have enough money for erasers here at the New York Times. So would you give us one? And I had put them off by saying, look, you know, the Bundesbank pays, Deutsche Bank pays, the New York Times should pay, right? You know? And then I'm thinking, OK, now I'm in front of this commissar committee that's not going to let us publish. And so I uh, went back to the New York Times and I said, uh, I'll tell you what, I'm in a bit of a jam here. We need to cover the economy. Um, how about if we, we give you a terminal and you decide whether we're fit to print, you make that decision. But I'm pretty sure you'll find that our stuff is good, good enough. And uh, you get the terminal. We'll, we'll then be able to say to the commissar committee, we're uh, you know, in a newspaper. Uh, you know, they can recognize that. So 
It actually was an idea that everybody liked. It went all the way up to Max Frankel, who was the editor in the New York Times at the time. He thought it was a good idea. So Bloomberg Terminal was installed in the New York Times. We got the credentials, and almost a day later, I got uh, 40 requests from 40 major metropolitan dailies. Well, we want what they have. So I went to Mike Bloomberg, and I said, look, uh, uh, Here's the situation. What do you want to do? And, and he said, well, that sounds good. So overnight, we were suddenly syndicated, if you will. And it wasn't just 40. Within a year, it was 100. And it wasn't just 100 in the US. It was newspapers all over the United States. So you know, it became a huge event for us, as it turns out, because somebody said, we don't have a criteria for you. That's an amazing story. Um, you've been an editor-in-chief for 25 years. Do you have a story that's the most memorable to you? Well, um, yeah. I guess, I guess the one that surprised me the most, uh, and you would have thought most unlikely, um, because it only happened once, and it hasn't, you know, it hasn't been repeated. We're in the the beginning of the financial crisis. It's 2007, um, which was the prelude to that awful year, 2008, when Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, when the entire financial system, Western financial system, pretty much went into gridlock. Uh, you had people like Mohammed El Arian, you know, at then at the time of uh, Harvard Endowment, formerly of PIMCO, then back to PIMCO, saying to his wife, go to the ATM because there's not going to be any money you know, in the next few days. And this was right after the Lehman Brothers. So it was a real crisis. Uh, the system froze. And you know, the Fed, Federal Reserve had been slow to appreciate that the financial crisis occurred uh, originally in two things. One was the subprime housing debacle, where people were flipping houses you know, 10 at a time in the space of a year. It was that bad. And banks were happily lending money to people who shouldn't get the money because real estate was always going to appreciate. So that was one part of it. And then that subprime debt that uh, was so essential to creating the housing crisis uh, would then be packaged in the form of a very exotic securities, which Bloomberg News coined the term toxic debt. We were the news organization that first introduced those two words together, toxic debt, because it was taking this really bad stuff, mixing it. It was like if you were allergic to anchovies in a salad, taking the anchovies, putting it in the salad. Everybody loves the salad. They don't realize their anchovies in. Some people are, you know, allergic. World got sick on that debt. Um, and uh, Bloomberg was re reporting this at length, the Federal Reserve had initially said, oh, this crisis will be contained. That was a favorite word at the time, contained. Everybody used it. The Secretary of the Treasury used it. Uh, the President of the United States used it. And the Chairman of the Federal Reserve used it, contained. But it was anything but contained. It was now explosive. And so the Fed, in response to its credit, great credit uh, under Bernanke, decided we're going to have to do something that we've never done before in, the, in almost 100 years, the Federal Reserve. We're going to have to buy everything we possibly can. It was the prelude to what became known as quantitative easing. We're going to just buy every security, whatever it is. And up until that point, the Fed was just buying AAA US government stuff. Now they're buying everything. Okay, And nobody knew what they were buying. Nobody knew what they were buying. Nobody knew how many banks the Fed was dealing with, and it was hundreds. And it wasn't just US banks, it was banks all over the world. So Bloomberg News came to the conclusion, you know, the public has a right to know this, all of this, because the Fed is the agent, or the Treasury is the agent, the US Treasury is the agent for the public. And the Fed is working, Federal Reserve Bank of New York is working for the Treasury. So every American has a right to know what their government is doing, especially with so much at stake. And it was not billions of dollars. It was trillions of dollars. So we asked the Fed, please make this public. Oh, no, no, no. We can't do that. Why can't you do that? Oh, because 
uh, it would set off a run. It would cause calamity. It would, you know, create a crisis. You know, people aren't entitled to know their children. You know, forget it. I'm paraphrasing here. You're getting a bit of my editorial commentary on this. Uh, but I thought this was outrageous, and so did my colleagues at Bloomberg News. So we became the first and only news organization to sue the Federal Reserve. And uh, we were successful the first time around in Judge Preska's court, and the Fed appealed. And we were successful the second time around, and the Fed appealed. And it looked like it was going all the way to the Supreme Court until the Obama administration at that point said, is now in power. Is it, we had, I think we had started the suit sort of in the transition. And the Obama administration decided it didn't like the idea that it was withholding all this information. And the court had already ruled that the Fed had no case. So there was no evidence no history to show that what the Fed was asserting was in any way uh, defending the public interest, just the opposite. So um, we won, uh, to make a longer story shorter. And uh, we got all that data. Uh, they didn't make it easy for us. They just sort of unbundled it. It was all a mess and everything else. But we were able to be the only source in the world to show people all the write downs of banks. You know, the big story back then was too big to fail. So we could show anyone who went to the Bloomberg, every single financial institution in the world, how much of their uh, debt was written off, which was a lot. I mean, we're talking about Citigroup, big institutions you've heard of, Bank America. And also how much the Fed was giving them. You know, and part of the reason why, um, you know, the hate Wall Street campaign got started and a huge vampire squid entered the vocabulary is because people were outraged that, you know, all kinds of people who had nothing to do with finance were dispossessed of their property and their livelihoods and everything else. And here were the banks getting loans at zero interest rates from the Fed. And our position at Bloomberg was, Leave it to everybody else to make a dis judgment about that, but everybody should should know this, should be aware of this. And so that's why we sued the Fed. We won, and it set a very important precedent. I like to think that as a result of that, the Fed, to its great credit, by the way, has become much more transparent, much more connected to the public, especially under Janet Yellen. Her four years were probably, I think, the best Fed ever measured all sorts of ways and we can do that. But uh, so that was an important milestone for us. And I think everybody. Okay. You can go. Um, thank you for this story that talks about press freedom in the United States that probably wouldn't have happened in other countries. And my question is Bloomberg operates internationally and in places like China where there's really tough internet restrictions and places like Russia, which is where I'm from, and they're cracking down on internet as well. How do you navigate those environments and make sure your journalists stay safe, especially those who are not American citizens? So uh, that's a great question. And uh, the answer to your question, short answer is with difficulty. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's very difficult, but long before China was uh, on everybody's sites in front and center long before that. Uh, there was a much smaller country, very important country in the uh, global economy called Singapore. Mm -hmm. And like just about every news organization of stature that came before us, uh, we got into trouble with Singapore. Um, and um, is an example of exactly what you're talking about, um, you know, what the hazards are and how do you deal with it. And the way that happened was um, one of our columnists, not, not a reporter, an opinion writer, uh, at the time living in the very comfortable uh, state of Connecticut, mm -hmm. decides to write a piece about um, 
where the economy is headed in Singapore in the context of the ruling family. And one of the nouns you could never introduce in your copy if you were writing about Singapore and the Wall Street Journal, Asian Wall Street Journal, the International Herald Tribune, The Economist, just about everybody had tripped over this uh, issue before we came along. You couldn't use the word nepotism because if you did, Singapore would literally throw the book at you and it would be a huge financial penalty that if they wanted to could put you out of business, at least in Singapore. So our columnist, of course, uh, without me knowing it, had uh, introduced that word into his copy. And I happened to be uh, on a vacation with my family in the Outer Banks. And it's 1 o'clock in the morning. The phone rings. Couldn't be good, right? <laughs> and uh, it's our legal counsel. And he said to me, um, you know, you have a problem. We've just been served with papers by the Singapore government. Um, you know, what's your thought on that? And I said, pay right away. He said, pay it. Pay it instantly. And he said, OK, I was going to try to get you to go there, but you made it a lot easier for me. And I said, no, 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 no. There's no way we're going to win. Nobody's won before us. There have been, I don't know, 20 cases of this precise issue. There's no way ours is going to be any different. Pay, and we go about our business. And that's, you know, that's, they make the rules. It's not a democracy. Um, and uh, live to see another day. I'll tell you what I was thinking about at the time. Is that Bloomberg didn't just have uh, reporters in Singapore, and we had a lot of them at the time for us. Uh, I think more than 60 in Singapore. It was a hub for us in Asia. But we also had um, native Singaporeans who were involved in sales, native Singaporeans who were involved in analytics for Bloomberg, native Singaporeans who were involved in data collection, native Singaporeans who were installing Bloomberg uh, terminals all throughout Asia. We had a big office. And Singapore could easily punish us by punishing their own people, um, which is the most effective way to get to anybody which is basically hold hostage, not your financial assets, but your human assets. So that is what I was thinking about at the time. And that's why I said, settle this, um, which we did, by the way. And um, you know, our people were OK. Um, and uh, I got excoriated by um, the New York Times opinion section. Um, because uh, you know, they thought it was craven that we were settling, even though the New York Times, which was then the owner of the, the Herald Tribune, the International Herald Tribune, Herald Tribune had done exactly the same thing we did, only they paid a much bigger fine because they dra dragged it out for long and then they lost anyway. Mm -hmm. So, it just, But um, you know, he said it was craven, and I was thinking, OK, here's the difference. The only assets the New York Times has in any of these countries is reporters. We had our entire business there. So we had physical assets. They didn't have a printing plant in Singapore, you know, and all that stuff. So um, it's, a, it's totally about, ultimately, how well you can do what you do, as effectively as you can do it, um, for us at least. And that's a good thing, because we can always, you know, make we can make where we are better by what we do. We know we can make it better, but it's imperfect. And we don't make the rules. And you know, the United States is the only country, unfortunately, that literally has the protection of the press, as you well know. You know, almost every journalism school, probably including this one, has somewhere, you know, Thomas Jefferson's famous line about, you know, given a choice uh, between the press and uh, and uh, the government, he'd rather have the press. And, uh, you know, we're lucky that way. So it's very difficult for Americans to impose their set of values, their beliefs. The best thing we can do, though, is through our work, make more and more people appreciate 
why they need the press, why the press is indispensable. And, you know, uh, I dare say uh, Singapore is a lot better off today because Bloomberg News is there and doing very well and, you know, reporting on every, all kinds of things there, just like we are everywhere else. So we're going to get into trouble uh, just doing our jobs. We're going to get into trouble, but we have to try to live to see another day. You know, I sit on the uh, board of the Committee to Protect Journalists. Uh, I've been doing for some time, and, and my my responsibility is the finances of the CPJ. You know, I'm the finance committee head. Um, and, you know, a day doesn't pass where uh, literally, as you well know, journalists are being murdered uh, everywhere. Um, you know, and it's not, by the way, in, the, in a lot of places that get most attention, it's not China. It's certainly not Singapore. Uh, they're getting murdered, unfortunately, uh, where you come from uh, in Russia. Uh, they're getting murdered in Mexico, uh, and uh, this is not going to go away. And so uh, we have to engage as much as we can, and that's sort of where it is. You have to engage. You have to figure out a way to engage, but uh, you can't stop what you're doing. You have to do it the best way you possibly can, but you don't make the rules everywhere, uh, and you don't have the benefits that you have here in the U.S., as a follow-up to that, um, could you describe a situation of when you maybe had to make a difficult editorial decision to kill a certain story? Um. Um, so, fortunately, I never, because of Bloomberg, the way it works, Bloomberg News, the way it works, at least in the 25 years I was editor-in-chief, I never got to the point where I had to kill a story. I never had a story in front of me where I just said, no, that's not going to work. Uh, what we did have were elements of a story, pieces of a story, parts of it. Uh, but our editorial process was so, um, I, I dare say at the time, um, transparent that before we even got to the point where there was a story, I could say, this is duplicating something we've already done. This doesn't have enough of a surprise in it. We need to go back and get more surprise to make this work, things like that. So I never had the, you know, the, the moment that some people, uh, I guess, have in the business where they just say, okay, we're not going to run this. Um, and I didn't like to run Bloomberg News that way because there were many of us, and I wanted it to be as collaborative as possible and as many people along the way, team leaders, managing editors, and executive editors, all part of the process. I was certainly involved. And partly because I wanted to be involved, we got to deal with things, I think, more effectively before we really could be um, at, at that point at the end. Um, so I wouldn't say that was, that was the, uh, the worst moment. The, I guess you know, the most challenging moment was, not that it was a surprise, because it was the first conversation I had with Michael Bloomberg was what happens when your reporter writes a story about one of your biggest customers, uh, if not your biggest, and the story is uh, true, and your biggest customer considers it uh, unacceptable because it's so perceived as unflattering to your biggest customer. What do you do? Unfortunately, Mike, uh, without batting an eye, or um, pausing, he just smiled at me and he said, my lawyers are going to love you, uh, which was the right answer. And sure enough, in the 90s, during the dot-com uh, boom, which became a bubble, a financial bubble, there were many of our customers, and one in particular, where they were getting into trouble with regulators all over the country. I mean, not only in the country, but all over the world. And we went to this very big customer and we said, um, we're doing a very big story about you and all the trouble you're having with regulators because of deals that are considered running afoul of regulations. And uh, they knew what we were doing and because that's how we operated. Uh, was always show them everything we got, basically, so that there are no surprises that way. And um, 
they made it clear that if we ran that story, uh, 70 Bloomberg terminals would be removed. Um, and it was Credit Suisse versus Boston, at the time, or Credit Suisse at the time, uh, in the 90s. And um, Mike Bloomberg knew, and uh, the other co-founder of Bloomberg, Tom Secunda, knew. And they weren't happy about the fact that they were about to lose 70 terminals, but the two of them said, hey, uh, everything, you know, we had, we have lawyers and everything that said, look, the, the reporting here is solid and everything else. So we ran the, we ran the reporting and 70 terminals were removed. Now, the story kind of has a happy ending because uh, about seven months later, the CEO of that firm was dismissed and new leadership came in and we got the 70 terminals back. But that was an example of us, the news organization, um, really presenting a problem to the business of selling Bloomberg's. And by the way, we had that issue over and over again. You can, you can see where this is going. So we're in the, uh, the uh, financial crisis. And, uh, you know, the financial crisis, sadly, was about um, reckless behavior. And uh, many of our biggest customers were um, uh, involved in reckless behavior, had to pay big fines and whatever. And so, uh, if you will, the best period for Bloomberg News, we should be the ones to cover the financial markets with more detail, more scope, more size, everything than anybody else. And we did. And so we broke a lot of stories. And uh, the CEO of Bloomberg, uh, um, at the time, because Mike was mayor, uh, he, 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 had a, he had a big day job and a night job downtown. Uh, the CEO at the time, Dan Doctoroff, would come see me almost every day, and he would look at me like this, and he'd say, they hate you. <laughs> he meant it. Um, so it was not an easy situation, but, you know, that's the news business, mm -hmm. and it's messy. There it is. Uh, I want to shift focus a little bit. Um, I understand that you've uh, done a lot of work with diversity, uh, including the, um, the uh, Bloomberg UNC diversity program, and you chair the International Women's Media Foundation board. Is what you're on the board as well, and uh, one, that's appreciated. Uh, but two, uh, we took a trip to Bloomberg a couple of weeks ago. A beautiful place, by the way. They have amazing snacks there if anybody's ever been. <laughs> it's great. Um, but... Uh, one you of can thank Mike Bloomberg for that, well, by the way. It starts I, with him. When I see him, I'll let him know. Okay. Uh, you can. <laughs> He'd be happy to hear it from you. Uh, but one thing is um, uh, there weren't a lot of people uh, at Bloomberg that looked like me. Um, and the people that I saw who did look like me were all the security guards. And so uh, I just want to know, what is it, what, what will it take for us to, to have more of a marriage between those diversity efforts, right, working with, like, uh, the, the women's group and... Um, and uh, the UNC Diversity Board, and then that marriage between the actual practice of Bloomberg and the day-to-day. -day so uh, you're absolutely right. So I, you know, I mentioned already the Federal Reserve, and uh, uh, one of the things that um, you talk about existential moments of great stress and anxiety. Uh, for me, it came right about the time of the, uh, the global recession after the financial crisis, when even though we were making enormous strides in progress, um, narrowing the gender gap at every level at Bloomberg, uh, the, the percentage of African Americans covering the economy, finance, business, not just at Bloomberg, but pretty much everywhere, was from hunger. And it was, and, and I mentioned the Fed because here is the most powerful, I think, most powerful uh, institution really in the world because it, it really sets the price of money every day. And everything else uh, is dependent on that. Every country is dependent on what the Fed does. And in the four decades that I've been lucky enough to be a journalist, uh, not once in that four-decade period, and dare I say the decades preceding it, 
whether it was a, a local platform of stature, a national platform of stature, an international platform of stature, was there an African-American on the beat covering the Federal Reserve, okay? Not anywhere. And that means that, you know, the people who are asking the questions of the most important institution look and sounded like me. And that's just totally uh, outrageous is what it is. And it's outrageous because, um, you know, what came out of the financial crisis were two sort of narratives. One was too big to fail. It was about financial institutions being too big to fail, right? Um, you know, and the, and the other was, you know, uh, you know, giant vampire squid, okay? Uh, those bad guys on Wall Street. The one thing that was missing from the narrative of the financial crisis, and a lot of books have been written, a lot of memoirs, all right? And almost all of them, as far as I know, are written by people who look and sound like me. Actually, they're smarter than I am and more articulate, but um, you get the point. The biggest victims were um, people who lost their houses, people who were, you know, drummed out of their communities, you know, uh, and not their fault, okay? You know, and there's a direct connection between what I just described and, if you like, Confederate statues all through the southern landscape. And, you know, only a handful of pretty courageous people like, you know, Mitch Landrieu recognize that's a big economic event. That's a big economic story of oppression. I mean, even the Great Migration, you know, was really about an economy of people living in the South who couldn't do what they'd been doing for decades, who were very accomplished, and they were pushed out of the South because they were getting lynched, and they had to come North. Okay, that narrative isn't really taught, and it isn't really reported. And so, you know, I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking, okay, uh, and I'm with my indispensable absolutely indispensable man to Bloomberg, Tom Cantiliano, and we're at Hampton University uh, four years ago, I think it was. And I said, you know, this is driving me nuts. Um, do we have a pipeline of people coming to Bloomberg, or is it the doors open, everybody's welcome? And he said, it's the latter. And I said, well, we've got to figure out a way to change this. And clearly, up till that point, up, you know, no one, all the best intentions, had been able to change the equation, where the people who are covering the story of money in all its forms don't look and sound like me. Okay, it's, it's just uh, so we had to change the equation. How do we do that? Well, we came up with a plan, which was we have to start literally in the classroom of journalism. And we have to create an aspiration. And, and the way we create an aspiration is we have to bring a narrative, a historical narrative, to that classroom and explain, why do you think it took until 2016 for the students at Yale finally to convince the administration that Calhoun Hall had to go? Why did it take until 2016 for the students at Princeton finally to convince the administration that the mural of Woodrow Wilson one of the greatest racists in American history, even though he was president of Princeton and governor of New Jersey and president of the United States. Why did, why did that have to go? And by the way, you know, when he was president of the United States, succeeding uh, Taft, w w Wilson made Washington a segregated town because he took all the African Americans out of the civil service, which was illegal, by the way, because that's who he was, and he could do it. And why could he do it? Because the people who were writing the story and asking the questions looked and sounded like me. Okay, so there's a whole historical narrative goes all the way back to the present. I mean, to, right to the present. So we have to change it. So how do we change it? You bring that a large part of the history, and you say to the best and the brightest like yourself, if you want to speak truth to power, Okay, there's nothing wrong with the sports beat. There's nothing wrong with the entertainment beat. There's nothing wrong with the political beat. But if you want to really speak truth to power, you got to follow the money. 
And we at Bloomberg are committed to doing that for you. So we're going to create a curriculum and we're going to bring it to your classroom wherever you are, whether it's Hampton, whether it's Missouri, whether it's UNC, whether it's Berkeley. You know, we've got Berkeley and UNC on our agenda in another month. We're going to be there doing this program. And it's so far early days, but at least what we're doing is we're reaching people who are just beginning to think about I want to be a journalist, and we're saying to them, right. And the best thing you can do as a journalist to speak truth to power is to follow the money. And Bloomberg will help you get there. Thank you. Um, I, I, another part to that question um, regards Bloomberg itself, right? So when I think about Bloomberg, um, I read it in the context of like my work and my research. So. My research is focused on helping uh, minority and small uh, uh, businesses better communicate with their target audiences. And so uh, when I think about Bloomberg, I think about Sean, my barber, who owns the barbershop down the street, or Lee, who owns uh, the small restaurant down the street, um, and, and those small businesses. And so I question, um, what do you feel the value for those people are uh, that Bloomberg brings to them? So. We never met a business story we didn't like. Uh, we never saw an economy we didn't want to cover. Uh, and to us, that has always been our story. The economy, companies, markets, investors, um, prosperity, the creation of prosperity, uh, the ups and downs of the economy. Um, and so in order to bring that story, which we think, by the way, is everybody's story. We actually think that's the most important story. And so wherever we are, we embrace commerce in every form. And by the way, even covering higher education is a form of commerce because you've got people here who are busy raising money so that you know, the students here can do more, better, faster. The faculty can do more, better, faster, that sort of thing. That's an economy. That's a business story for us. Um, and it's always going to be a business story for us. And uh, we just think that if we come at, if you will, news that way, we're going to get you closer, you being the reader, the listener, the viewer, to what matters most and what's most at stake. And let me give you an example. 2016 still isn't a distant memory much as I guess some people would like it to be. But uh, it was a tumultuous year. Um, but the biggest story here, at least, was that it was a national election, as you're well aware. Not once by anyone. January 1, 2016, all the way to December 31st, 2016, did anyone do a big story about the only country in the world, the only economy, developed economy in the world that had record GDP after the financial crisis and the ensuing recession. The United States. Mm. The Obama economy. The economy that was meant to be so hostile to business was outperforming every economy, major economy in the world. I'm not including emerging markets, just including developed economies. It's a big story. Only one country, not Germany, not Japan, not the UK. You didn't hear it here in Colombia. You didn't hear it in Kansas City. Nobody wrote about it. But why is that? Well, part of it is no one was looking at the data and saying, what does the data tell us? Everybody was doing he said, he said, she said, he said journalism. And two candidates said the US economy is a disaster and got away with it. And the third candidate didn't want to offend anybody, so she didn't really say it was bad. She didn't say it was good. But the fact is, the fact is, it was very good. It was the best performing economy in the world in 2016, January 1. But you didn't hear that on nightly news. You didn't read it in your newspaper. You didn't read it online or whatever. That's what I'm talking about. That affects your barber, by the way. Um, Randy was making a sign that it's time for Q&A. Um, so if you guys have any questions, please. No? Yes, Michael. You mentioned some of the stories that 
local and regional outlets are un unable to cover, just don't have the bandwidth to, to get to. What are some of those stories right now that you see cropping up that may not be on people's radar, that in looking at the data and, and kind of reading the tea leaves you think are out there that are looming? So, um, it's a political story. But I like to think what we do at Bloomberg is something that academics actually consider very valuable, which is political economy. Biggest story, arguably, at least the one that has gotten a lot of attention uh, for political reasons, is the tax cut. Um, and you know, the reason why I bring it up is because everybody knows what it is. Um, I mean, it's very transparent, and we know exactly whose taxes got cut, um, where they got cut, and so on. So that's the kind of story that could be applied sort of universally across 50 states. Okay, so who's affected? How are you affected here? How are you affected there? You know, where I come from, which is, uh, I live in New Jersey, which is you know, probably one of the highest tax states if not the highest, I think it is the highest property tax state in the country. Um, there's, uh, you know, the, the surprise is that, um, you know, our taxes actually, if you're, um, even if you're rich, they went up because of the way the tax law was written. Um, it was partly designed uh, that way. We know that, um, but, that's an example of a story, a big story, a national story that you can go in any number of directions locally uh, to, the, to the smallest community, to the largest community, to the smallest city or village or town, to uh, the largest state, and you can report as much as you want. And you can do sights and sounds reporting, you can do data, you can do everything with that tax story. Um, and you don't have to make a judgment, by the way. You know, you can uh, you can really look at it any number of ways. Um, we're we're already you know a few months into it, so there's plenty of material to work with um, on that one. Um, you know, I I think that uh, there's when I was saying before um, about where the economy is. One of the uh, most interesting features of the economy emerging from the financial crisis, it's a good thing, and this also didn't get covered at all, is that at a time when President Obama was being assailed for being anti-business, uh, if you will, the debt ratios, and before you get nervous about those two words, think that's arcane or whatever, it's really a measure of corporate health. The debt ratios of corporate America were the lowest probably in American history also in 2016, you know? And that's still a story, interesting story, by the way. Could change, but American companies, very healthy, measured by debt ratios. And part of the reason is the financial crisis and the low interest rates and the Federal Reserve's policy uh, made it possible for American companies to heal themselves, uh, dramatically so, uh, to get back to uh, a very sound footing, which is why we have the economy that we have today. Uh, most Americans, I don't think, know that. Most journalists don't know that. We love debt ratios. Fortunately, I have you know the best CPA in journalism, Tom Cantiliano, working on our behalf, and he's, he does a great job, to, you know, getting people to understand how important that is. But that's another example of what I'm talking about, where you can apply it to many levels. Yes. So, if you could design. If you could design a project um, and you had the world's greatest journalism school at your disposal to um, be a great investigative reporters in middle America, what kind of project would you assign to that school? What's something that would be of great benefit to Bloomberg but would utilize the talents of this school and the, um, the geographic region that we, um, where we are? Okay, so um, I didn't mention this, and I, sh I should have in the context of what 
you know, what, what are the stories that are missed? Um, you know, talk about existential threat. Climate change is maybe our biggest, if not our biggest, existential threat, climate change. I mean, aside from a nuclear uh, war, which is possible, um, but, but, you know, both things are man-made in a way, and climate change is destroying uh, the way we, our, our, our way of life, it's happening. Um, that's a big economic business livelihood story, and it can be covered everywhere at every level. There isn't, there isn't a state in the United States right now that hasn't had amazing, unprecedented weather patterns. If I, if you know, whether you're in Missouri or anywhere else, you know about it. Um, it's not an accident. Um, it's not a fluke. Now we have people who say it is, you know, um, but I, you know, am somebody who sides with the empiricists, which means I'm, you know, allied with the scientists and 99% of all our scientists tell us uh, this is happening. Um, that is a huge story that is underreported everywhere, locally, nationally, internationally. Um, you know, the bigger news organizations clearly are onto it and doing it, but um, it should be the equivalent of front page news almost every day because we're living with it, we're seeing it. And by the way, it's very expensive. It's expensive for everybody. Uh, so there's the human cost um, is huge and it's an underreported story. Um, by the way, the suppression or oppression of data, <laughs> access to data. That's a great investigative story. I mean, we, we, we actually have somebody in charge of the EPA who doesn't want you to know. He's doing everything he possibly can to make it difficult for you to know. So if I was a journalist, um, wherever I am, whether I'm here in Columbia or I'm in Jersey City or uh, uh, Los Angeles, I would want to know, okay, so what's going on in my backyard? Um, and what are people doing about it with climate? And because it affects everybody. Yeah, we have one more question. Yeah, uh, you talked earlier about how you know, the How do you think about that within the context of the current health Especially globally. So, um, I've always believed that the story is um, always will be, always has been the most important part of what we do. It's the story. It's always about the story and the quality of the reporting. And I, I do believe that um, uh, reporting, great reporting wills out, that it, it has its own value, intrinsic value that uh, will be appreciated and somehow um, not always in the time that we want, but it will be compensated uh, because of its intrinsic value. In other words, that people will pay, figure out a way to pay for the story that helps us all, that informs us in a way that uh, we wouldn't be otherwise enlightened. Um, so I actually believe that today, right now, is in many ways the most promising period to be a journalist because the tools at our disposal, the technological tools to get access to data information, to check the veracity of the information that we have and the people who are supposedly providers of information is unprecedented. It's extraordinary. You know, I started on a manual typewriter, you know, six decades ago and to be able instantly to put a story together with a limitless amount of facts um, and data, same thing. Um, and to do it with such speed is, was unimaginable to me, you know, when I was making my way as a, as a, as a young journalist. So that is extraordinary. Now, I, I grant you, you know, misinformation, 
is everywhere. And, uh, you know, uh, it's Jonathan Swift who said in, I think, 1712, falsehood flies and the truth comes limping back. And, you know, that's fake news, by the way. Um, and, you know, that's there. But we have an opportunity today in journalism like never before to do the kinds of stories that were unimaginable when I was making my way. And that's very exciting to me. Okay, well, thank you very much, Matt. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you also, Liana and Rob, for a great job. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.